Welcome along to a special edition of our Subsbench programme. As you know, we normally feature uh, the Bristol clubs, but uh, whenever we get a special guest in the area, we like to chat to them. And there's nobody more special to me as a former Tottenham Hotspur fan, well, when I was growing up, than Steve Perriman, the uh, club record holder for Tottenham Hotspur. Thank you so much for joining me. My uh, pleasure. Just to talk about a few memories uh, that Bristol fans might not understand so much, but uh, uh, Somerset fans are going to get the chance to hear you talk about the old Tottenham days uh, in the next few weeks, aren't we? Because you've got a, an event happening in Bridgewater. Absolutely. 16th, which I think is Friday week, but 16th of September in Bridgewater. Uh, Ozzy and Ricky are paying me the respect of coming down wow. to the West Country to hold an event. Uh, those two have supported me. I, I expect there was some... Some support went back the other way back in the day when they joined us. But, um, but yeah, looking forward to it and it's selling really well. So uh, everyone's more than welcome. So what's the venue? Yeah, the venue is Blake Hall in Bridgewater. Um, it's sort of like a theatre, but probably a big room. Um, but it's not, it's not goes up the sides. But, uh, but, but so you're all at, at ground level, but it's a, it's a decent place. And uh, Ozzy and Ricky have probably got a three stroke, four hour journey to get to us, do their bit. I call it the Three Amigos show, because laughingly I used to call us the Three Amigos. So, um, and then they've got that journey back home and I think they're attending a Tottenham game the next day on the Saturday. So, so good of them to get involved and they're hilarious, these two. They are such good characters. Basically, when Keith Birkinshaw went over to Buenos Aires at near the end of the World Cup, of course we all saw our deal as one of the stars of the team that won the World Cup. But actually, you don't really know their character. Yeah. If an English manager signs an English player, he finds out from everyone around him the character of that person. I think that's very difficult to do with someone as far away as Argentina. You, you judge him as a footballer, but you can't judge the character. And, and of course, we know the character is as important as the, as the ability. So then to take a player that he hadn't seen a lot of, Ricky Villa, to sort of good decision to, for them to keep each other company, for the wives to be together, for the families to be together, grow up together. So um, they're, they're hilarious when they talk about their early days at Tottenham and the, the threat of Tommy Smith going to kick them for Swansea by this time and um, playing in five inches of snow at Portman Road. They've never uh, seen anything. Never like seen that. snow before in their lives. <laughs> so imagine, it's uh, there's a lot of laughing to be done and good, good times, good memories. And of course, Ricky, Ozzy won the World Cup. And Ricky not, won not the FA Cup. Didn't not he? on his own. And Ricky won the FA Cup. <laughs> not on his own. Fantastic goal. Yeah. Fantastic goal. And, and just an interesting story is that I was talking to Ricky one day and I said, Ricky, tell me what you did with the ball at home. And he lived on a ranch. So vast ranch, so many thousand head of cattle. And he said, Steve, I just had a football. I used to run in and out the trees and back, in and out the trees and back. And I know what I did. I was outside of my council house, just Not kicking the ball the against the wall, as we all did. And then, then you move to the, the road, because there was so few cars in those days. And we'd do a bit of keepy-uppy against a neighbour. And then w when more kids came out, we'd go over the park or the fields. So Ricky said, Steve, so you've got to understand that there's not that many kids in our area. So I didn't play 11 v 11 until I was 13. When by this time I've gone to the bigger school, but it's farther away. He said, in fact, he used to ride a horse to school. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what do you do with a horse when, when, when you're at school all day? So uh, he said, so I'm playing this first game, 11 v 11, and the sportsmaster or the coach or whatever you want to call him, is screaming at me, Ricky, Ricky, pass, pass it, Ricky, pass it. And I'm thinking, what's this pass? <laughs> so basically, when you saw that goal that was such a fantastic winner, he was just recreating what he did as a kid, yeah. in and out the trees, on the ranch. 
Wow. Mays and Earp. Manchester goes City back. defenders like, like trees then. <laughs> well, yeah, he had to beat Garth as well because Garth had no movement. He's just stood there <laughs> when you watch it again. So he had to beat Garth, beat the defender, beat another defender. Now we're all fearing he's lost his chance and guess what? He gets it in. Is that still the greatest FA Cup goal, final goal, do you think? Uh, I think the FA Cup has lost a bit of its sort of uh, glory and its shine. Yes. So I actually, if there's anything else to be done on that day, I don't wait for the FA Cup final. I'm not proud to say that, but that's how it was. In our days, you remember Enfield playing in the amateur Absolutely, yeah. cup final. So I certainly remember most finals from, I was born in 1951, probably from 56, 7, I remember every team that played in the cup final. Knott's Forest beat Luton 2-1, etc. Yeah, yeah. And um, so some fantastic moments. Ken Montgomery saving the shot at goal from Leeds when Sunderland beat Leeds yeah, famously. Yeah, yeah. So all those famous moments. And, you know, this is what... Um, you know, this this was folklore to us, mm. wasn't it? These, it was. These stories. And, and, the, and the Tottenham thing was that you always won the cup in the years ending six, uh, one and two, didn't you? Absolutely. So I I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, and, and uh, Spur Forever. And I always say, once a spur, always... Once a spur, always won. Yeah. Just to, just to pay respect to that one part of the, yeah. the famous years, 60, 61, 20, 21... 50-51, just keeps coming. It certainly does. Now, you are very proud to have been the record appearance holder for Tottenham Hotspur. Um, do you look back now at, at the game then and look at it now and think, well, these are almost two different sports altogether? Yeah. Pitches, uh, agents, uh, punditry, uh, Cameras everywhere. You... Everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Um, the, the media going on behind everything, social media. Um, you know, if I had a rough spell at Spurs, which I think I did for about 18 months, you know, if you were the wrong type of character, that type of intense scrutiny could kill you. Yeah. And then do you come back from that when it sends you even lower than you are? Yeah. So um, I'm... Absolutely delighted for the era that I played in. An era where managers ruled. I think there's a lot of people between the manager and the owner now, which suggests they don't trust the manager. Well, if you don't trust the manager, don't appoint them. So I, I like the era where Shankly was all powerful at Liverpool, Bill Nicholson all powerful at Tottenham, Ferguson. Wenger, these people ran the club from top to bottom and there weren't all these people in between and um, and they took the responsibility and they ran with it and if they lost the game it wasn't because this or that or the laundry lady etc it was their problem and it was their problem to put it right so um, I liked although I played for the banner of Tottenham Hotspur I got in the team, I signed for them, for Bill Nicholson. And he worked for Tottenham Hotspur. But I was dealing with Bill Nicholson every day. He made all the decisions on my career. When I turned pro, if I was going to turn pro, when I made my debut, if I was going to make my debut, should I stay in the team or not? And um, that's what I liked. You had one man, strong, powerful, enough about him to handle all of that. Okay, there wasn't social media, there wasn't the press scrutiny that there is these days. I sometimes hear, I think it was Solskjaer when he eventually got the sack. I think there was mumblings of him getting sacked probably about seven or eight times before that. And one minute, say the BBC, just to pick out a name, they're talking about stress and anxiety. Well, football manager doesn't have stress, doesn't have anxiety. He hasn't got kids that go to school that are getting grief because of what someone just said about him on television. But it's all so important when it's about something else. But because it's football, the national game, it's okay to say 
he should get the sack. Yeah. What other industry does that happen? No. And owners, uh, I know there are now lots of multinational companies owning clubs, but owners who the fans sort of say, oh, well, he needs to put his money in there, you know, he needs to buy people. Um, and yet, would they put their own money in? Probably not. Well, I know a bit about that because I, um, I went to Japan, a very respectful country. I worked with under Ozzy for three years. Then I took over as manager when he went to Europe. Um, you ran it. It's your job, your responsibility, your decisions. Get on with it. If we like you, we keep you. If we don't, we pay you up and off you go. And the players looked at you as the manager with that power and said, he's the man, we follow him. It's like a Japanese thing. Yeah. You're, the, you're the governor of this company or this company of people. You decide and we follow you. You had no problems if you changed the team, if you left someone out. You had no problems. And um, so, yeah, uh, came back and I was never going to work for... I'd, I'd done enough for my own ego, but also for my bank balance in Japan, that I never had to work for another sugar. Alan Sugar is the only man that can say sack Steve Berman in 45 years in football. The only man. And it's nothing like you see on television, trust me. It's nothing like, it's not the, no style, no class, no nothing. So, um, so when I came back, I decided, uh, second marriage, two young daughters who were six months old when we went to Japan, and second one was born there. We decided to go, when we came home, to go to Devon to bring up two daughters. I helped Texas City, fan-owned club. Now, these fans were the ones who turned around to the owner, spend some money, spend some money. And uh, now they're the ones who've got to spend some money. And guess what? Didn't want to. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah. But they, they should have turned the finger on themselves. Spend some money. It's very easy to spend other people's money. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. But what they did do right was they, they decided, well, who decided? I think we did. That the only way out of their trouble, their mess, was to produce young players. And actually, as much as you like to think how good you are at passing on information and using your own experience to help that young player be good enough, it's also a numbers game. So Bristol, an hour that way. Plymouth, roughly an hour that way. So if you do it right, there's a certain amount of catchment area where you've got control. Yeah. And if you do it right, the numbers games throw up a certain amount of players. But now you're helping that by your own experience. So um, that was the best decision they made. And I think the other week they picked an 11 that there was nine homegrown players in it. That's really unusual in this day and age, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. And they got Ollie Watkins representing their name in Aston Villa. Yeah. And Grimes at Swansea and so-and-so. And Stansfield, did you, did you hear the Stansfield story? Yeah. Great story. Yeah, yeah. Great, I great. knew Adam Stansfield when he played for Yeovil. Yeah, great, great story. And he's glad, having left Exeter for Exeter's benefit in terms of a transfer fee. And then he worked his way into the team, just come on a sub probably a couple of weeks ago and then they decide to let him out on loan for more experience I suppose when they'd signed a couple more players wondering if it was going to inhibit his progress and he goes back to Exeter and they bring out the number nine shirt yeah, again brilliant. and that says a lot about football it doesn't always have to be cutthroat no, no. which it, it is turning into that yeah, as a reporter, I can tell you it's, it's not the same game it was I used to report. I was fortunate enough to, in your day at Tottenham, I was working in Liverpool and covering Liverpool and Everton, and uh, the experience of interviewing Great. Bob Paisley and seeing the way he worked was just fantastic. Great. So I'll, I'll never ever forget that. Um, we, we could talk for ages because, I, as I say, I confess I was a, a Tottenham Hotspur fan when I was a kid. Um, but we, Who was your favourite player? I, oh, you were, obviously. No, uh, Greavesy, don't Greavesy. dare, don't uh, dare say Gre that. Greavesy was always my favourite player, and, and I, I imagine you probably played in this game. Uh, the, the game that sticks in my mind, apart from the UEFA Cup finals, but amazingly, it was a testimonial. It was Greavesy's testimonial. He'd, he'd been at West Ham and he'd come back 
and Tottenham played Feyenoord. Yes. And there was about 50,000 in White Hart Lane, and within about, uh, my mind says within about 10 minutes, so it might have been a bit longer. Greasy waltzed through the defence and scored. I, I it was passed, amazing. I passed him the ball. You passed him the ball. Yeah. And, and that, that as and I think, was a I think, testimonial game. I think he was offside. But, but quite possibly, that's, the that's referee, not that's If not the referee or linesman had disallowed that, there would have been a riot, wouldn't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Uh, so, so that actually, strangely, a, a testimonial game was is one of my favourite memories. Because I played with Jimmy Greasy, for six months. Yeah, and he's such a lovely bloke as well. Wonderful. I met him, I met him several times as a junior reporter and he was kindness personified so yeah, uh, yeah rest in peace Greavesy. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him in later life when he was on it on tour doing his talks yeah and if he was down in the west country where I was living he'd invite me as a sort of an extra guest yeah and then I would do the question and answers with him so I was bringing a sort of a, a current a current football theme yeah. to a to his old stories, if you like, but what a funny Lovely man. bloke, lovely bloke. We'll have to end it there, um, but uh, I hope lots of people turn up, Steve, and see your event with Ozzy and, uh, and Ricky yep. in Bridgewater. Great. Uh, thanks so much for talking to me. My pleasure, thanks.